good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Please continue enjoying your, uh, enjoying your uh, lunch and your dessert. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and get started because I know there's going to be a lot of questions, so we want to give as much time as possible uh, for the lunch and talk and also for the Q&A. So please start thinking of your questions now. Uh, I'm Keith Richburg, president of the FCC, and I'm really excited that, uh, well, I'm really excited we're able to have this event. Uh, <laughs> you know, given how things are going these days, we're back to our, our, our lunch and talks now. As you see, the club's busy. All of our talks are full. It shows that people are just dying to get back to normal. Uh, so thanks all for coming. Uh, do continue eating and, and, and drinking. Uh, the, uh, the talk today is about uh, Singapore's leadership transition, pr uh, prospects for political reform, and implications for economic competitiveness. And as you all know, there's, every, you know, if you, you can't be in Hong Kong without hearing Singapore mentioned in conversation these days. I'm sure you all know people who have moved there. Some of you may have spent time there trying to get back into Hong Kong. <laughs> or, or, or you may be looking around to see if Singapore is the next place to go. So we're gonna be talking about uh, that and all, all kinds of other things today with, with our guests. You know, Singapore's ru uh, ruling party has uh, been exceptionally adept at accommodating the global shifts and economic pressures and changing sentiments in the region uh, without uh, significant uh, democratization or change. And that's been going on for quite a number of decades now. But uh, we're now in what's called a new cycle of managed renewal. And we've got a new uh, prime minister designate in the works. We're gonna learn about a little bit about who he is and what's going to happen. And this panel is going to look at some of the contradictions uh, in, in the ruling structure of Singapore, which has made it such a powerhouse in the region, but also might be stifling its prospects for growth in the future. And we've, we're so lucky to have two Singaporeans uh, to be able to discuss and explain all of that with us today. Uh, next to me is Cherry and George, who I've known for a long time. He's a professor of media studies at Hong Kong Baptist University. And his, uh, uh, his, he's got, they've got a couple of books out actually, but the, uh, I'm sorry, the cherry is down on this end over <laughs> here. And they've got a couple of books out. The newest one is called PAP versus PAP, about the People's Action Party uh, versus itself, uh, which is the newest book. And I'm told there's, uh, there's a copy of it over there by Doug Wong. And I'm told that there are maybe even eight or so copies here. So if you're lucky in one of the lucky eight, you can get here. <laughs> And then next to me here is Donald Lowe, who's a senior lecturer and professor of practice in public policy at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, as well as being director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies. So please give a warm welcome to both of our guests here. <laughs> and uh, on the end, Cherian, let me just start with you with one question. We'll just take a couple of open-ended questions to start. but. Uh, you know, I first started as a foreign correspondent in Asia in the late 1980s, and we were talking about this is the moment when Singapore is going to reform and open up. This is the time now because you've got a growing middle class, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, I want to just ask you, is, it really, is this really the time now, or why is this different from all the other times that we thought something might change in well, Singapore? Well, thanks, Keith. And, and first of all, thank you, Keith, as well as uh, Bowering for uh, thinking of having us. It's a great pleasure to be at the FCC talking about a subject that we're able to talk the whole day about, but we'll try to confine our remarks to just five minutes or 10 minutes to uh, leave lots of time for, uh, for questions. So I, I think your question answers itself, right? I mean, this is a, this is a question that comes up repeatedly. Uh, this looks like Singapore is on the cusp of change. Uh, Singapore is a city of contradictions. How long can these contradictions last? Something must be afoot, right? Surely there's going to be a, a reform happening any moment. Uh, and of course, viewed from Hong Kong, I think the, uh, as you've uh, mentioned, the, uh, that question has become especially pertinent and relevant. Um, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong have always uh, been an interesting, though somewhat abstract study in contrast. But in the last couple of years, you know, that comparison has become, I think, much more pointed because it's taken practical significance for reasons that uh, Keith has mentioned. Um, it, it's also taken more significance because uh, whereas in the past we used to think of Singapore and Hong Kong as well. Singapore is Singapore, Hong Kong is Hong Kong, never the twain shall meet. Now people are asking, well, is today's Singapore the Hong Kong of the future? Uh, and uh, this prospect of convergence, depending on who you are, either Hong Kongers find it incredibly reassuring to become more like Singapore or downright terrifying, right? <laughs> 
The, uh, but to answer your question uh, more directly, I think the short answer is that there is no real uh, strong political reason uh, for why the PAP, the People's Action Party that has been ruling Singapore since 1959, uh, should feel any pressing need for change. Uh, simply because uh, in its own eyes, this is a model that works, that has proven itself over the decades uh, in terms of the economic deliverables as well as political deliverables. Uh, the fact that the PAP has won every election at the most five years apart uh, is not something that can be scoffed at um, after all. Uh, so what is this model? Some aspects of it may seem obvious, others less so. Um, first of all, Singapore adopted uh, the key tenets of neoliberalism uh, even before this ideology had a name. Uh, upon independence in 1965, uh, the ruling party decided that Singapore's survival and success uh, depended on being plugged into global capital, making itself relevant to global business. Uh, this has been the North Star of, uh, of Singapore planners. Everything follows from there. Uh, for fortunately, the, this economic orientation has been mitigated by the PAP's uh, democratic socialist roots, uh, from which grew the uh, public housing program, for example, that is the envy of uh, most Hong Kongers. Uh, what may be less obvious is how the PAP has entrenched itself uh, politically. Uh, undefeated in elections since 1959 and likely to win the next one as well. Now to folks at either end of the political spectrum, the answer to this conundrum seems obvious. Strong defenders of the PAP say that it boils down to good government. The PAP has done a fantastic job and is duly rewarded by voters every time it goes to the polls. It sounds plausible but you know there, there are 10 or 20 countries that are at least as successful as Singapore. Uh, that have standards of living uh, that are at least as good as Singapore, and all of them are multi-party democracies where people tire of governments and uh, turn them over. Uh, so uh, good governance alone cannot explain the kind of longevity that the PAP has enjoyed. Uh, people's, people will always find new issues to contest. Uh, there is no society in the world where politics becomes extinct simply because people are too happy. <laughs> uh, at the other end of the political spectrum are those who say that Singapore's political stability is down to repression, full stop. But again, uh, you know, a comparative perspective uh, should quickly disabuse us uh, of this notion. In countries with, with much higher levels of repression um, than Singapore, you see, in fact, more political contention than Singapore does. Uh, so repression can't explain it either. So the truth probably lies uh, somewhere in between. Uh, political scientists categorize Singapore as a, either um, illiberal democracy or an electoral autocracy to try and capture its hybrid uh, quality. Uh, and I'd argue that uh, the PAP has located um, an elusive sweet spot, elusive to most regimes, um, in how to maintain the regime. So on the electoral front, it has uh, created a political system that is not fair. Uh, it strongly favors the incumbents, but it's free enough, just enough, to continue to be accepted by the opposition and its supporters as the only game in town. Uh, so there's no serious boycotting of the process and participation rates in elections are high. Uh, as a result, elections for all their flaws serve the basic function of bestowing significant legitimacy uh, on the uh, victors, and, and though the chance of a ruling party MP actually losing his seat uh, on average is slim, uh, the risk is real, uh, creating a palpable incentive for members of parliament and the executive branch, all of whom are elected MPs, uh, to work pretty hard for the people. Um, and I should add here that when I say work hard for the people, uh, in Singapore ideology, we mean citizens. Uh, Singapore has not embraced the international human rights approach to thinking of people as people. Uh, there are citizens and then there are others like migrant workers and so on who are not seen as deserving of equal dignity. 
So as for uh, Singapore's autocratic tendencies, there too you see the ruling party uh, finding a sweet spot between coercion and consent, or what social theorists call hegemony. Uh, so repression is present and real, but not routine. Uh, the state has steadily uh, decreased its use of violence, uh, substituted it with uh, fairly sophisticated means of co-optation. Um, uh, they have they confine um, the worst repression to really a small number of activists, and as a result, coercion is neither so extreme nor so broad that it stirs mass outrage uh, or makes people feel. Um, a sense of identity with those who do get in trouble. Most people do not get in trouble. So uh, uh, the repression is not so great that it extinguishes um, people's sense of enterprise or autonomy. It just raises the cost of open dissent just above what most people are prepared to pay, uh, leaving oppositional politics uh, to the truly committed minority of Singaporeans. Uh, this, uh, I think there, there are good reasons why most countries have not been able to find the sweet spot. I do not expect Hong Kong authorities, even if they want to model itself on Singapore, to be able to find that sweet spot. They can try, they will fail for reasons I'd be happy to, uh, to elaborate. But uh, let me just say in summary that having found the sweet spot, I find it extremely difficult uh, to imagine that the incoming political leaders will see um, great, um, have a great political incentive uh, to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, uh, and I mean that seriously, the right thing to do is to reform, mm -hmm. but it is just not necessarily a politically uh, wise thing to do. Okay, uh, just a quick follow up. Uh, every election, we look at what the percentage of the vote is, and the PAP, People's Action Party, share has gone down somewhat. They're not getting 90 percent. Uh, but it's never gone down below 60 percent. It's never gone down below 60. Is that something they care about or not really? As long as It would have symbolic value even though it is constitutionally insignificant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Uh, let me bring you into the conversation, Donald. Mm -hmm. I mean, t tell us a little bit about uh, the prime minister designate. Who is Lawrence Wong? What do we know about him? Is he going to be the one who really turns Singapore around? In terms of background, he's very much like uh, Singapore's Carrie Lam except that he's much more competent. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, I worked that with... That's not saying much. <laughs> that's not saying much, right? That's, just, that's the no-brainer. Motherhood statement of the year, right? You uh, just made the headline here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I say similar background because he's always been a technocrat. Right? He got a government scholarship in the late 1990s. Singapore is a very elaborate system of giving uh, talented young people scholarships. Uh, they even gave me a scholarship. Uh, greatest mistake the Singapore government ever did. Uh, and Lawrence uh, was really a very gifted e economist. I mean, he didn't go out to any of these top Ivy League universities in the US. He went to one that did serious economics. He went to uh, Madison, Wisconsin, did his undergraduate degree there, then went on to your home State uh, University of Michigan did his master in economics there. Then he had a subsequent, a second master in public administration from uh, the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, and then he served in the administrative service uh, in, in in Singapore from the early two, late 1990s mm -hmm. till he joined politics in mm -hmm. 2011. So he's really an economist uh, in his primary instincts, uh, uh, totally committed to public service. Uh, so I, I, I agree largely with what Sharon says that you should, in terms of political incentives, I'm, I'm an economist also, and um, so I look at w the world through the prism of incentives. So in terms of political incentives, there's not, no great uh, motivation right, for him to, to be a reformist. Uh, but at the same time, the PAP is also adaptable. Right? In, the, in the brief that we wrote for, for this talk, we said that it's, it's very adaptable in accommodating new pressures, uh, changing global sentiments. Uh, and we are now at a stage globally, I think, where this neoliberal ideology mm -hmm. is clearly defunct, right? It's clearly in decline. It's, it's, it's a long march to death. Mm -hmm. This idea that all we need is, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do for markets is set them free. And I think Lawrence understands that enough. Uh, and I think in his, most of his uh, statements after he was announced as the Prime Minister, Dexanet has been to emphasize that Singapore needs to find a new social compact mm -hmm. right, around creating a fairer, more compassionate, uh, society, while maintaining elements of neoliberalism, right? a highly meritocratic mm -hmm. 
society, uh, maintaining uh, essentially a market-based, market-driven economy, but softening its edges. Right? So efforts to uh, reduce inequality, which like Hong Kong, Singapore being a city-state, uh, inequality is, uh, is, you know, tends to be much higher than in uh, bigger countries. Uh, so, so, I, so I expect to see not significant changes like chairing. I don't expect to see significant changes in terms of political reform, in, in terms of outright moves to democratize uh, or to make Singapore more politically contestable. But I expect on the social and economic front, right, uh, significant or at least substantial moves to, to balance the market with uh, a more activist state. Now, bear in mind that Singapore, by, by the standards of Hong Kong, the Singapore government is already extremely activist, paternalistic, interventionist, intrusive, right? Not just in public housing, but in almost every other uh, uh, walk of life you can imagine. Uh, but I think that they will do it in a way that you know, gives citizens a sense of uh, autonomy while still reducing inequality. Most, I think most obviously in health, in education, in housing, uh, in providing more support for low income, uh, in uh, maybe even some substantive changes in uh, pension reform, uh, which I think uh, are, 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 are much needed in Singapore's context. So, so that's, that's where Cherry and I see that, that, that the reforms will be more on the technocratic sphere mm -hmm. uh, in terms of remaking or rejuvenating Singapore's social compact and less so in the political sphere. Mm -hmm. let, 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 me, let me follow up on the question I know a lot of people had. Everybody's asking, is Singapore going to replace Hong Kong as the global financial center, the media hub, et cetera? You were quoted in The Economist uh, piece of just uh, a, a few weeks ago, the July 2nd Economist had three articles, not one, three, on whether... Uh, who's going to emerge on top, Shanghai, Singapore, or Hong Kong? Uh, that's something that's a bit of an obsession here in Hong Kong. What, what, what's, what does Singapore yeah. think about this so-called well, first, first rivalry? Is, yeah. <laughs> first, it's not an obsession in Singapore. So Singapore it's, this is very unusual, right? I mean, this is something that Hong Kong has suddenly become obsessed over. Uh, in Singapore, I think policymakers as well as establishment elites are a lot more concerned about maintaining Singapore's status as a leading manufacturing hub. Uh, than in competing with Hong Kong as a financial services uh, hub. Uh, simply because manufacturing is still 20% of GDP in Singapore. Uh, in Hong Kong, it's less than 1%. So I think the economic structure of Singapore is very different. Uh, the second thing is not an obsession in Singapore is because whether Singapore replaces or competes, outcompetes Hong Kong as a financial hub has a lot more to do with what Hong Kong is doing or not doing <laughs> than anything Singapore does. I mean, I'm an economist, so I look at this through the lens of an economist, right? A place, a place becomes a hub and stays a hub because of something we economists call network externality. The idea that a network is more valuable the more people are in the network. So network externalities mean that, also means that once you're a hub, you tend, you, you tend to stay as a hub. It is a self-reinforcing dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it breeds what we sometimes call winner-take-all dynamics. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why hubs tend to be very entrenched. Uh, so the fact that we're even asking this question, will Singapore replaced Hong Kong as a financial hub. Says so a lot about how Hong Kong is screwing it up, right? Messing it up <laughs> in terms of maintaining its position. Because if you don't, even if you don't do anything, you will stay a hub, right? Even if you just maintain business as usual, you will stay a hub. So it, it reflects a certain ex extraordinary degree of incompetence, right? Uh, 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 to to. To, to, to lose your hub status. And, and I, 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 I've said it many times to my Hong Kong friends, well-meaning, I, I say in the, in the most well-meaning way possible, which is that you know, Hong Kong is really committing economic suicide uh, with, with many of its, uh, with, with its COVID restrictions. When I was back, in, I spent the last four months in Singapore and I was telling my ex-civil servant uh, colleagues mm -hmm. in the civil service and I said, I can't imagine how a hub, right, a successful, thriving, dynamic hub would want to give up its hub status in this way. You know, what, you know what's the most common line I hear from my civil service friends? They don't know, please don't tell them, because as Napoleon says, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. <laughs> so that's, that's the... That, and so, and, and so you know, if Hong Kong were to lose its financial hubs, it's not because of anything Singapore has done. It's largely of the kind of policies and the kind of re response to COVID that, uh, that, that Hong Kong has chosen. Sherian, what do you think? I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, banks, hotels, et cetera, saying they're moving their offices or they're moving their back offices or headquarters to Singapore. Some say temporarily, 
while COVID's going on. But I mean, is, is I don't, I don't have a financial up? bone in my body. <laughs> and if, uh, if you're resorting to asking me, then Hong Kong is really in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will. I mean, you mentioned the media hub thing, though, yeah. and uh, if, if I could say a little bit about that. Uh, then it's interesting, I think very different from the uh, financial industry, I imagine. But I, I do think that decisions about where uh, media companies or uh, foreign correspondents, uh, bureaus and so on locate is much more particular and micro to their particular situation, right? Uh, it's, uh, it will suit certain media to continue locating in Singapore, it will suit other media to locate in uh, in uh, Hong Kong, depending on what your risk exposure is, depending on your area of coverage, and so on. So, I mean, I think that sort of the general uh, uh, question of uh, is Singapore going to replace Hong Kong as better as a media hub than Hong Kong, and so on, uh, is is really too broad. It's not a meaningful question. I mean, I, I would say uh, this: that Hong Kong and Singapore, you know, even for the um, uh, journalists or bureaus that now see an incentive to move to Singapore from Hong Kong. Um, if you drill deeper, it's not, it's clearly not because Singapore has a freer regime than Hong Kong does. Even now, um, the facts are that Singapore laws by and large are more repressive than Hong Kong's. Yeah? Uh, first of all, uh, there's a lot of ahistorical analysis comparing media in Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, it is true that uh, Hong Kong has gone through this ugly period in 2020-21, uh, unprecedented attacks on media. Uh, Singapore, by contrast, is a sea of calm. That sea of calm is only so calm because Singapore did a Hong Kong 50 years ago. <laughs> right? So in 1971, uh, Singapore's most popular, largest Chinese language uh, newspaper was massacred. Uh, f uh, four executives and later his publisher thrown into jail without warrant uh, and without trial for two to five years. Uh, that newspaper was uh, reformed into today's Lianhe Chao Pao, right? Uh, so we did have our uh, night of a thousand knives or whatever you call it, <laughs> about 50 years ago. So of course things are calmer now. Um, has, this, has Singapore become, uh, but uh, does that calmness mean, uh, does it mean that the Singapore government is any more tolerant of dissenting journalists? Absolutely not, right? Uh, but still, I would say it would make sense for, uh, for example, China facing media to relocate to Singapore because, of course, the Singapore does, the government doesn't really care how critical you are about China if you're in Singapore. But if you have illusions about doing investigative journalism about Singapore, <laughs> then frankly, uh, the room that, um, that Hong Kong journalists have to do investigative journalism about and in Hong Kong is far greater than the room that journalists have in Singapore doing investigative journalism on Singapore. Mm -hmm. The same would apply to academics. Uh, if, you, um, if you are an academic, uh, who wants to study China, it may make more sense to locate yourself in Singapore now. If you are an academic who, has, who is committed to studying your own society wherever you are in a critical way, and you imagine that by moving to Singapore, you'll be able to study Singapore <laughs> more critically as an academic than a Hong Kong-based academic is able to study Hong Kong, you're dreaming. Uh, Singapore's academic freedom when it comes to studying Singapore is less than what Hong Kong academics enjoy studying Hong Kong, right? So to cut a long story short, it depends what you're looking for, it depends what your risk exposure is, depends on what your agenda is, um, and I wish everyone the best in finding their, <laughs> their, their, their perfect home and continuing their, you know, uh, their careers. Yeah, and uh, another question for me, and please think of questions because I want to come to the audience in a moment. But uh, one thing that might pro uh, inhibit people from going to Singapore, I've been reading about a bit of a backlash, a public backlash against immigrants, but also wealthy expats moving to Singapore, you know, uh, taking jobs that Singaporeans could have. Is that, how, how, how real is that, uh, Donald, do you want to start? Yeah, so I was in the Singapore government back in the early 2000s when there was, a, as part of this, neoliberal consensus around the world that, you know, we are competing for not just investments, but talent, mm -hmm. right? And Singapore being this uh, global city or global ci aspiring global city, we should 
do whatever it takes to attract uh, global talent. So that was the period where immigration drove a large increase in population. In the, in the, from between 2000 and 2010, Singapore's population increased by 20%, resident population, mostly driven by uh, immigration. I think post-global financial crisis, that ideology has lost a lot of, lot of its shine. So Singapore, like other countries, cities around the world, takes a much more nuanced approach to immigration, right? Because uh, you've seen what is done in Britain with Brexit, you've seen how it propelled the rise of Donald Trump and, and, and this form of authoritarian populism. So the Singapore government, I think, has been quite astute in sort of like calibrating its immigration policies. Uh, it still welcomes talent, in, uh, much more welcoming than most other uh, developed countries. Uh, but getting a permanent residency, obviously, is uh, going to be harder. Uh, also, um, there's a sense within the population that Singapore is at its uh, capacity limits mm -hmm. in terms of how much more, how many more immigrants we can absorb. And I think the PAP being this, the PAP government, uh, you know, has to reflect or at least has to acknowledge that public sentiment. Mm -hmm. So immigration rules have tightened in, uh, in, in recent years, uh, but it is very much part of this evolving consensus on how much uh, you know, global talent should uh, countries, should cities like Singapore uh, uh, accept. And, 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 so, and so that has put a, a little bit of a dampener uh, in terms of Singapore's efforts to attract uh, you know, leading mm -hmm. talents, whether in finance or in media, to Singapore. But as I said in the Economist piece, I said Singapore doesn't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It just ha has to be better than its rivals. And considering how Shanghai and Hong Kong are not you know, doing particularly well, it's, it's a very low bar right, for, for, <laughs> for, 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 for Singapore. <laughs> Jerry, and you agree? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we'll take questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's open it up for a lot of questions. I know there's going to be some. I see uh, in the back uh, on the veranda there, Mike Michaels. Mr. Michelson back there. Uh, thanks very much. A fascinating subject. Mark, I'm Mark Michelson. Uh, I am Asia. Uh, I'm from Chicago. I'll just start that. And so I recognize a lot of what you're talking about. We too had a father and son who sort of dominated politics. But I just wanted to add, before I ask a question, one, one area that was helpful to them staying in power too was public services, either withholding or, or giving them out to various districts depending on how they voted. So that's, that's another important part, and I think Singapore shares that. I want to ask about companies. I chair, chair a group of regional uh, executives who head multinational companies in the region. They're ba based in Hong Kong, but also in, in Singapore and Shanghai. Some of them from Hong Kong have moved to Singapore or have moved part of their operations to Singapore, not just because of what's happened the past few months, few years, but also because of a little difference in approach to some extent that some of them have seen. They've gotten support from the Singapore government and the Singapore government has been more open. And one example I give is sharing economy. And you know some of the companies involved with this, Singapore in general, the government has been more open, doesn't crack down, doesn't, doesn't uh, go into offices and arrest some of their employees and so on. And the rationale they gave was that, that this would maybe encourage Singapore entrepreneurs to get into similar businesses. And one can argue that Grab, and it may not have been the reason the Singaporean company has done that in many ways, and in, in often in cooperation with Gojek in, in Indonesia. Is this, a rel is this something you see in Singapore, that despite the government control that you, you described and it's sort of a rigid system in some ways, it also is flexible in some ways, especially when it's seen for the good of society and the good of the economy? Yeah, that's a great. Can I? Can I? Uh, you yeah, you want to take more sure. questions? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So th that was surprising, right? When when the when the likes of Uber first emerged, you would have expected Hong Kong to welcome them with open arms, given this myth about Hong Kong as uh, a free market paradise and Singapore being a much more controlled, regulated society. Yeah. But it was the reverse. It was Singapore that was doing the front running, even not just relative to Hong Kong, but even relative to the rest of the Southeast Asia also. Singapore was the most welcoming place for ride sharing. Uh, when that first uh, emerged on the scene in the early in 2012, 2013, uh, Grab, what is now called Grab, did not start in Singapore. Uh, the, the, the two founders are now Singaporean because of activist efforts by the government to make them Singaporean, to <laughs> welcome Grab. Uh, th those two, uh, Evelyn would like this, uh, the, the two founders were Malaysians. Uh, 
Mm. And they had won a Harvard Business School case competition you know, about setting up this ride-sharing service like Uber in their home country of Malaysia. But they faced so many regulatory and bureaucratic obstacles in, in KL. So Grab was originally not called Grab, it was called My Taxi, MY Taxi, Malaysia Taxi, right? Uh, and, and they faced so, so many obstacles, political, regulatory, bureaucratic in, in Malaysia, that it created an opportunity for Singapore's Tamasic Holdings, right, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, to say, why don't you relocate to Singapore, make Singapore your home? And through them incentives, through them, right, just basically made it really attract, made Singapore really attractive. Uh, and, and, and that enabled Grab to compete with Uber. And eventually, they beat out Uber. They bought over Uber's business uh, in Singapore. And, and now they're uh, listed. They're, the stock has done really badly after they, <laughs> they got listed. But that's beside the point. I mean, it, it speaks to your point, uh, Mark, about how when, when it chooses to be, the Singapore government can be extremely, not just adaptive, but extremely open, lib liberal in, 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 a, in, a, in the proper sense of the word, uh, supportive but not intrusive. Uh, when it comes to businesses. Where it is not supportive and overly interventionist is usually in the political realm, right? Uh, but when it comes to business and when it comes to attracting new entrepreneurs and uh, new business models, Singapore is way ahead uh, of Hong Kong. And, and another respect which I think also distinguishes or differentiates Singapore from Hong Kong is what I referred to earlier, is that this idea that Hong Kong is some kind of free market paradise is a complete myth. Right, Singapore, uh, and this place is run by essentially by oligarchs and monopolists. Right, uh, in Singapore there are oligarchs and monopolists too. It's just that they're state-owned. <laughs> right? So as I, as we used to say in the Ministry of Finance in Singapore, the only thing worse than a public monopoly, which Singapore has a few, is a private monopoly, which Hong Kong has lots of. Right, uh, and you know at least with a pu public monopoly, that being a public mono mon mon monopoly curbs the monopolist predatory and parasitic instincts. In Hong Kong, there's nothing to curb their predatory and parasitic instincts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think, so I, and I think that, and, 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 and so going back to the Uber story, why, why was Uber treated the way it was? Because it threatened the monopoly or oligopolistic interests of the taxi industry here. Mm -hmm. Not taxi drivers, mm -hmm. uh, the owners of, 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 uh, of, 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 I mean, the, 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 the capital owners in, in the taxi industry. And, 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 so, and so I think a lot of our popular conceptions about Singapore being this state-controlled, state-run, and therefore unenterprising, inefficient uh, economy versus uh, you know, freewheeling, capitalist, innovative economy, entrepreneurial economy. I think a lot of those perceptions are misperceptions. They're based on unfounded myths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, unquestioned myths. Yeah. Okay, I see former club president Philip Bowering there with a question. Barring, uh, three questions. First of all, uh, can you address the future of the Lee family, uh, both in the politics of the PAP and in the bro broader uh, context of Singapore? Secondly, can you address the fact that Singapore in the Southeast Asian context is less important than it used to be because of the increasing importance of Indonesia and in, uh, in another neighbor, which is India? That's my second question. And the third question is, could you please address the issue of the demographics of Singapore, which are about as bad as Hong Kong's, worse. <laughs> uh, or worse, <laughs> and uh, how long can you boast that Singapore is a sort of egalitarian kind of place of public housing, when one third nearly of the population has no rights to public housing, has no rights to have a family, etc., etc., and uh, in a situation which is actually quite racial in its context? You want to divide those up? Or yeah, let me take the first and a bit of the third, and you can take the second and third. Uh, the first question, the, the future of the Lee family, I guess you're alluding to the, um, to the rumors that uh, we might be seeing a third generation Lee. So the, one of the grandsons of uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, whose uh, handsome Sorry. visage is there on your wall. Uh, who's the son of the current, sorry, a, a civil servant who's, um, public servant who's currently the, well, uh, uh, currently a public servant who is in his 30s, I guess, uh, who's the son of the uh, current prime minister, is being groomed to take over as a future prime minister of Singapore. Um, I, I, I don't remember when the last time I had a conversation with Lee was, but, uh, so, but my, my hunch 
is that uh, it is, it's plausible that um, some individuals in the Lee family, perhaps the young man's parents, uh, had, uh, had ambitions that maybe putting it too strongly, would have liked to see him enter politics uh, and perhaps become a future leader. Yeah? Uh, that's plausible. Um, I frankly uh, do not think it is, um, well, I do not actually expect that to happen. Yeah? Uh, partly because even if the parents want it, I think it'll be harder than they imagine. Uh, but also because even if they had wanted it at some point in the past, I actually don't think that they are stupid enough to try to make it happen. Uh, why do I say it would be stupid for them to do so? Um, it would be stupid because I think it would actually be uh, the X factor that leads to the ruin of the People's Action Party. Uh, two things could happen. Uh, one, uh, there could be infighting within the party uh, leading to one of the scenarios that have been speculated for decades that the PAP will one day split. Uh, I think that the party could split over this. Um, even if it was possible for that to happen, for the second generation Lee to take over from the, um, uh, from the patriarch, I don't think the situation is the same now. Uh, I do not imagine that uh, current and the next generation of PAP senior members, including current ministers, are simply going to roll over after investing more than 10 years in public service for this Johnny-come-lately to simply overtake them and take up a uh, leadership position. Right? Uh, if they are so lacking in self-belief and uh, a sense of self-worth that they are, in fact, willing to prostate themselves, uh -huh. Um, and allow uh, this younger Lee to just march all over them, uh, I think Singaporeans will notice. Uh, and uh, Singaporeans would be so outraged at, the, at their lack of conviction and of spine uh, that the PAP will, in fact, lose heavily in the election uh, that follows, uh, leading Singapore to, uh, effectively, the multi-party democracy that uh, has never been part of the Singapore landscape uh, all these decades. Uh, so whichever happens, uh, the, uh, a split in the PAP because there is in fact enough individuals with spine in the PAP or the PAP surrendering to this third generation, Lee, either scenario would spell uh, major uh, reform in uh, Singapore's political landscape uh, as a result of this. Um, on, on your last point about um, the inequality in Singapore. This goes back to the point that I made. Uh, uh, Singapore is not a country that uh, thinks of um, uh, its constitution or its values in an expansive human rights framework. Uh, Singapore is a country for citizens. That is the ideology that has been successfully sold by the party to the people. Uh, you are not going to find many Singaporeans sharing the view that uh, simply by virtue of being in Singapore, let alone the broader hinterland beyond Singapore's borders, uh, from which Singapore um, has a very unequal economic relationship, you're not going to find many Singaporeans actually sympathetic uh, to, in, uh, the, to migrant workers who are literally leading a different life from them. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say that uh, any uh, government, any leader that tries to reverse this and change the, the, um, the way we think of Singaporeanness uh, in terms of uh, human rights values that belong uh, uh, to anyone who happens to be in Singapore, rather than something reserved for Singaporeans, that leader will actually pay a political cost. Uh, Singaporeans would not stand for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like it, but that's, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's true. And I think there was the other the question. Second question on, on, Indonesia, uh, on, on Indonesia, right? Indonesia. Demographics, yeah. Yeah, so I think the way it will play out 
on one on one level, the Singapore's rapid aging is not a fiscal challenge, right? Because there is no public pension. I mean, everybody's or Singaporeans are expected required to save for their own retirement through the CPF. Uh, uh, I mean, in Hong Kong, what's the CPF uh, rate? Uh, the MPF rate, ten percent. Yeah. Singapore is thirty-seven percent. So about a third, uh, up to a third of your more than a third of your income uh, is compulsorily saved on your behalf. <laughs> right, this is <laughs> the clearest manifestation of a very paternalistic state. Of course, you can do a lot more with the CPF monies than you can do with, with your MPF monies. You can use it for housing. You can use it for healthcare, besides retirement. Uh, so in, at that level, at that superficial level, uh, aging is not a major source of fiscal liabilities uh, for the Singapore state. Uh, in, at another level, it is, right? In the sense that the way which the majority of Singaporeans, I would say about 80% of Singaporeans, their, their primary source of retirement security is in the public flat that you know, presumably they bought from the government or they bought in the secondary market. Uh, and those public flats have, have aging leases, right? They, they started on 99-year leases. Uh, the average age of a public flat now in Singapore is about 45 years. So we have still some ways to go. But it's also the case that past 40 years or 50 years, it's much harder to get a bank loan if you're trying to buy a public flat on the secondary market. And so we can expect that story of asset or housing appreciation, which we've seen in the last 40 years, significant, huge asset appreciation. Maybe not as much as in Hong Kong, but still significant nonetheless. And a very important source of retirement wealth, right? So retirement security for the vast majority of Singaporeans. You can see, I think that that, that story of asset appreciation will probably end. Mm -hmm. right? So housing is no longer this reliable uh, store of wealth that grows but at, on average, 4 or 5% per annum. Then what, where does that leave uh, retirement security? And which is why I started out by saying that, you know, almost by force of, or well, in this case, by through demographic force, the next prime minister will have to confront this squarely. Right? How do we give or, or deliver retirement security through mechanisms? Or you, you can't deliver it through the mechanism that we used to deliver it, that the government used, to, which is through public housing. Now we do find more direct ways. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and typically in developed countries, how has that been done? Mm -hmm. It's been through a public pension system, right? Uh, combined with contributions, contributory elements from, from uh, working citizens. So I think that, that's in, inevitable. I think, I think Philip also had a question about the region. Uh, was it around Indonesia, Philip, that you... Indonesia and India, would it? Yeah. yeah. So I think the, the, the big picture is that for most of its first 50 years, Singapore succeeded in spite of the region. Or that, at least that's the narrative we tell ourselves, right? That, you know, what, 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 what's the term we use? We are a, a first world always... Yeah, we are first world oasis in a third world neighborhood. This right? is how, how, how condescending, right? Oh, that's mean. <laughs> yeah. Mean. Uh, but but that's, that's, that's the kind of you know, nation building myths we tell ourselves, right? Uh, we were just at the table saying about how Malaysia is always seen as the other, not, not Hong Kong, right? Hong Kong doesn't loom that, that large in Singaporean's eyes. Because Malaysia is everything that we, we think we are not, right? Malaysia is corrupt, we are not. Malaysia is not meritocratic, we are, and so on. And, and in, in, Indonesia is not far behind as being demonized. Uh, and, and so for most of the last 50 years, Singapore, the, the myth we were told or the story we were told was that Singapore succeeded in spite of the bad region we're in. Right? We succeeded because we leapfrogged the region. We plugged into global capital networks. We attracted multinationals. We, uh, we became part of the globalization system. We were not held back uh, by the region. But I think that's changing now, uh, not least because of slower globalization. Uh, global supply chains are fragmenting. Uh, I think globalization will continue, but in a much more regional Fall and, 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 and that's where Singapore will have to adapt, right? Uh, you have to, I think that Singapore's prosperity going forward will increasingly rely on the rest of the region mm -hmm. uh, being more prosperous, right? With the rest of the region, region uh, doing better economically. And I think to a large extent, Indonesia is doing better economically. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the omnibus law that they passed, I think it was last year, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which frees up or, or at least liberalizes the labor markets more, makes it more attractive for foreign investors to go into Indonesia. I think all that would you know, put in place a, a more favorable set of supply side conditions that will uh, you know, help Indonesia uh, develop. Now, mind you, Indonesia is never going to be a China, right? In terms of its growth rates, in terms of its attractiveness to, to uh, global capital. But as long as Indonesia grows at 5 to 6%, I think that will be very good for Singapore. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Singapore will need to find, and, and it probably has already, it's already finding uh, a healthy you know, uh, relationship, economic, political, security relationship with Indonesia. Uh, Singapore has as many direct flights to Jakarta as to Hong Kong, right? 
Probably uh, more. Maybe probably more. more. Probably yeah. more. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It's, relations are very, very. Uh, <laughs> yes. and, and we are free to go and come back without quarantine. That's right. Let's go quarantine. <laughs> Let's. Uh, we have two questions at this table. Let's start with the green dress. <laughs> and then across from the green dress lady. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Gigi, the green dress one. <laughs> um, I'm a portfolio manager in the asset management industry. Um, three questions. First one regarding to what we just talked about, the capacity limit issue. And do you think um, currently Singapore is going to prioritize certain sectors for further development and also for attracting the young talents? Before, because in the past, I, I would assume that like Singaporean government was pretty open, um, you know, Across to, the board, yeah. exactly. Um, and also this, and I also would like to understand like from your perspective, um, what kind of sectors would Singapore try to, you know, boost going forward and try to differentiate itself, um, you know, compare with Shanghai or Hong Kong. Right. And the second one, I mean, for example, like a startup industry, which has been the case in the past. Um, second one, um, would you also see like a really imin imminent issues in terms of the price increases, like the housing yeah. price increases, yeah. um, the rent price, um, which we have already seen in the, in the banking sector, in the healthcare, in the pension you just mentioned. And also what I'm also interested in the public schooling, given a lot of like experts like bring their yeah. kids and families moving to Singapore, sorry. And uh, the third question is also, I think the current Singaporeans should be pretty happy with the current, um, like how the government has dealt with the COVID situation. I mean, not in the past, but now. And uh, would you think this is gonna, you know, gain the popularities uh, for the government from the citizens or mm. in a reversed way? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I quickly take those. Uh, I think in terms of, sectors, given the constraints, that given that immigration is probably going to be a lot more selective, certainly permanent residency. So I think one filter that the, I don't have an inside story to this, but one filter that the authorities would use would be what kind of skills you bring and which sector you, you, you work in. Right? So I think they're going to prioritize probably tech startups uh, and, and anybody with uh, STEM skills that you know, in, in general, in Singapore, everybody sees that there's a shortage of STEM talent, right? Uh, science, technology, engineering, math. So I think if, if they're going to prioritize any sector, it will be that. Second uh, group of people they will prioritize, wealthy people. Right? Singapore is, in, in, in one respect of the financial ecosystem, that Singapore is really making a hard push for relative to Hong Kong and Shanghai has been in wealth management. And it's been, it has been so for the last 20 years. Right? You look at other aspects of finance, uh, Singapore is much less competitive than Hong Kong. Right? You look at uh, capital raising, you look at IPOs, you look at the stock market. Singapore is a, a pygmy compared to uh, the Hong Kong market. But when it comes to wealth management, Singapore thinks it has a good shot at beating Hong Kong. And I think they're right. I mean, if you look at the number of family offices that have been set up in Singapore uh, and, and, and how relaxed, relatively relaxed the rules are uh, to attract family offices uh, to Singapore. You know, I think Singapore has done a fantastic job. Uh, with some uh, negative consequences, of course, the rise in housing price, uh, rentals in the last six months has been astounding, right? Uh, no, no thanks to Hong Kongers and, and, and folks from the mainland fleeing to Singapore the, the once they had the chance. Uh, so that's driven up uh, prices, at least at the top end. Uh, then finally, you had a last, what was your last question? Uh, oh, right, yeah. So Lawrence Wong, mm. if not for the government's and Lawrence Wong's superior handling of COVID, he probably would not have become Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. If not for COVID, Lawrence Wong would not be the Prime Minister of Dexanet, yeah. right? Uh, because before COVID, they had, uh, they had announced uh, the then Finance Minister, Hing Sui Kiet, as, mm -hmm. uh, as the um, Prime Minister of and, and they even announced alongside that uh, who the likely Deputy Prime Minister would be, uh, an ex-general called uh, Chan Chun Sing. And then, COVID came in 2020, and uh, Lawrence Wong somewhat mysteriously was made the co-chair, along with the Minister for Health, as the chairman of the COVID task force, uh, right? Uh, and, and I think he surprised everyone, including me, who, whom I've known Lawrence for more than 20 years now, uh, by how confidently and how competently he, he, he led the task force. And I think his you know, almost daily press briefings were generally very well, well done, right? He's a great communicator, very reassuring, without over-reassuring, laid the facts before 
citizens. And I think that propelled him into, why, why aren't we considering him uh, for at least DPM, if not Prime Minister? Uh, and then we had the elections in 2020, which our book talks endlessly about. Uh, and then <laughs> during, I think it was during the 2020 elections where the then Prime Minister designate Heng Sui Kiet kind of fumbled, right? Uh, just Google Heng Sui Kiet <laughs> fumbling <laughs> on a, uh, with East Coast plan. And I think, and, and he didn't do too well in that, particular, in that election. I think his, in his constituency, he only won by 54% of the popular vote. So well below the PAP's uh, average vote share. I think, I think that, that led to uh, concerns that, you know, this, we, we need another candidate, right? So this, this has been a, man, a difficult transi leadership transition, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or at least unpredictable, if not a difficult one. Uh, and, and, and so that's how, so without COVID, I think Lawrence Wong might not even have become Prime Minister. He, he established his credentials, won the trust of, I suspect won the trust of most Singaporeans. So I think it is both his handling of COVID and the government's handling of COVID certainly uh, added to his popularity and potentially it remains to be seen, could add to the popularity of the PAP going to the next elections. Mm -hmm. And let's get this question in the corner. I'm Rachel from the Chaixin Media in Beijing. So I have just uh, have one question. So uh, how do you think uh, the China led the RCEP and the US uh, led the IPEF? And what's the Singapore role? Is so uh, the Indonesia present uh, with China these days? Yeah, I want your perspective. Yeah. yeah, I'm not a trade economist. I don't study trade agreements because <laughs> You would think that an economist would know something about it, but it's really a lawyer's job to go figure out what the trade agreements uh, are talking about. Uh, so, I mean, Singapore is a member of RCEP. Uh, it's not, as I understand or, or what I've read, I, I haven't looked at the agreement carefully. I, um, it's, it's, it's not as gold standard as the previous, uh, uh, what was the, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreement TPP, Partnership, TPP, yeah. that was abandoned. After, well, that was modified significantly after the Americans withdrew. But RCEP is great for, I think, for the developing economies in Southeast Asia, particularly Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Philippines. Uh, Singapore, I don't, think, I don't think Singapore is a big, huge winner because Singapore is already so open and this is not a particularly a gold standard uh, trade agreement. Singapore is already a, such an open trading economy, so it's, it's not going to gain a lot from our set. But the fact that there is this trade agreement that involves China is fantastic for Southeast Asia. Uh, on your second part, the Asia... What, what the, the, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Yeah. I think it's too early to tell, and there's too little. It seems to me it's mostly driven by security considerations rather than a genuine economic uh, partnership or, or, or trade agreement. So, so I, I, I would withhold comments on that simply because I don't know enough about it, and I think you know, details are pretty scarce on, 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 that, on that framework uh, that the, the Americans have proposed. Okay, I know people have to get... There's one more at the back. Oh, I see. Well, Doug Wong had one here. So, a quick one. And we'll take one last one over there. I know people have to get back to the office, so... <laughs> is that, this is actually a quick kind of follow-up, if, if you like. But mm -hmm. um, why is it that even though two-thirds of Singaporeans support the policies of Xi Jinping, quite an outlier, according to the Pew Research Survey, yeah. the Singapore government's policies do not... And how long is this imbalance mm. sustainable? And I think this relates to the question about, you know, what is Singapore's role going forward in terms of a US-led kind of trade, regional trade framework or a Chinese-dominated one? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I, first of all, I think there, there was a good article in the uh, South China Morning Post this weekend, in the This Week in Asia cover story, yeah. that quoted two of our good friends, uh, Ian Chong and Linda Lim, who I think cover that point very, very well. So I'd, I would encourage you to, to read that article. The, I would just, uh, I guess, um, sound a little of caution not to overread into what seems like this love affair with China that Singaporeans show in surveys as well as in uh, how easily they buy into Chinese propaganda on WhatsApp and so on. Uh, and the reason why you shouldn't buy uh, too, uh, read too much into it is I think it's coming from many, many different directions. It would be wrong to conclude that there is, in fact, this solid majority of Singaporeans who are pro-China full stop. Right? There are many different things going on. There is, of course, a certain amount of uh, ethnic 
identity, uh, justified pride in the rise of China among some Singaporeans. Uh, there are other Singaporeans, probably a smaller group, with vested interests in China. They have economic dealings with China. That's another group. There are many non-Chinese who sound very sympathetic to China uh, simply because they're actually more anti, uh, Western anti-American. Right? So to give you an example, a concrete example, uh, there are many um, uh, minority Singaporeans, uh, uh, especially Muslims, who are equally outraged by the hypocrisy of the US uh, going on and on about uh, the war in Ukraine, not that uh, they're in favor of the war in Ukraine, but the, the, the fact that the US has the temerity to ride the moral high horse, given the US's own record in violating sovereignty of uh, countries around the world, in particular the US uh, lack of sympathy towards the plight of Palestinians. You cannot be aware of um, uh, what is going on in Palestine and not call out American hypocrisy at this time. Right? So there's some of that that comes into the uh, picture. There is, of course, um, uh, uh, quite a widespread anti-colonial and, uh, and therefore anti-Western uh, sentiment uh, in uh, Singapore that basically is extremely, uh, and I, in my view, largely correctly, and something that I think separates Hong Kongers from, uh, Singap Hong Kongers from Singaporeans. Uh, we have very little patience uh, with uh, you know, the kind of uh, colonial mindset that actually, from Singaporean eyes, seems quite rampant in Hong Kong. Uh, so again, uh, there is an instinct uh, to side with, the, with uh, the rivals of the US. Anything that will bring the US down a notch is welcomed because Singaporeans, by and large, are sick and tired of Western condescension. Right? So there's some of that too. Uh, but that, all that needs to be balanced against the fact that uh, Singapore is very, very far away from China. So <laughs> when we say that Singaporeans express pro-Beijing views, they're talking about something very, very abstract. Uh, Singaporeans can afford to be pro-China because, frankly, China is not next door. Yeah? So it's almost like believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah? It's as it's, it's abstract as that. Yeah, so so uh, it, does it actually mean that when it comes down to having to choose between the US and China in concrete ways that affect Singapore, Singaporeans would opt for China? I don't think so. Does it mean, for example, that Singaporeans would rather work for a Chinese-owned company than an American company? I sincerely doubt it, because the general impression is that American companies are much fairer employers that will promote Singaporeans uh, without a uh, color bar or nationality bar the way that uh, many Asian companies, including Japanese and Chinese companies do. Yeah? So, so don't overread into these surveys. Okay, and very last question here before I let you get back to your offices in the corner here. Hi, thank you. Um, just wondered if you could quickly cover um, how you see the opposition parties in Singapore and you know, what are they promising that's different to the PAP? To what extent could a lack of adequate opposition also explain the longevity of PAP? Yeah, so you're right. The, the opposition has always defined itself against the PAP, right? They, they, they tend to be, most opposition parties, in fact, almost all of them, with the exception of one, tend to be personality-based, not particularly well institutionalized uh, if they, if they even institutionalize at all. Uh, so, and, and in terms of their policy platforms, it's always more or less defined relative to what the PAP stands. So simply because the PAP is so dominant, it features so prominently, so singularly in Singapore's uh, political landscape, it's, you might say it's inevitable that everything has to be portrayed in reference to what the PAP has said. Uh, so, but one thing, and the other thing that, that's worth noting about oppositional politics in Singapore is that because the PAP is such a catch-all party, right, it, it, it's hard to define them as left-wing or right-wing. So it's captured pretty much the entire political middle ground. So, so the kind of spaces that the opposition can o occupy in terms of policy platforms or ideological positions are actually quite limited. They're right? actually quite limited. Uh, so, so, they, so in that sense, they don't really provide a coherent, uh, well-formed, set of policy alternatives or even ideological alternative uh, to the PAP. And, and that's what Charon was 
referring to when he talked about the hegemony, right, uh, where you know, they've captured this broad ideological, political, the PAP has captured this broad ideological and political uh, space, right? uh, almost the entire middle space of, of Singaporean politics. Uh, that anything that strays too far from that space is viewed as extreme, dangerous, radical, uh, and you deserve to be cancelled, right? you deserve to be censored. Uh, so, so that's the challenge also for the PAP, uh, for, 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 for the opposition, because you know, how do you create space uh, put politically for yourself when, when you are up against this you know, uh, hegemon, this political hegemon that is the PAP? I guess I'll just add that I, mean, just, I agree completely that you know, it's a... Uh, in this game, um, it's uh, the PAP is to lose rather than uh, the oppositions to win. Yeah, they have so many advantages. In the same way, I guess, as that in the financial sector, which many of you are intimately uh, uh, care about, it is Hong Kong's to lose rather than Singapore's to win. Yeah. So if you want to know more about that, get the book, it's called PAP versus PAP. I think you've got a few copies yeah. here, but it's also probably available in the bookshelves. Maybe not, not Hong Kong. Uh, well, Maybe. So <laughs> <laughs> or it's on Amazon. Uh, also, it's a Chinese version. It's yeah, a Chinese version as well. Uh, I, one reason I enjoy doing an event with Singaporeans is I don't have to put on my suit jacket, which is kind of nice. Everybody wears a shirt. I noticed you wore shirts that look kind of similar. So <laughs> you have to have I'm a planned. similar look-alike bag to go with each of them oh, from the you. FCC. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, audience, for being such a great audience. Now, for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.